for her own condition. So that's being called awful. Great genius to come in. And today I'm going to try a little bit about selectivity for people with chronic or chronic health conditions. <laughs> Oh, the light went out of these students, so maybe it's. Oh, There we go. Okay, seconds. I'm not getting an advance. Does that have to talk to this? Yeah, it'll. Uh, or does it talk to the slap? No, but just in general. Does it talk to this? Or does it talk to. This. So we thought we were good? No, this is not. So while they're thinking, while it's really good, um, I just wanted to say thank you so much to our class and the general community for having me be today to talk about this. Um, I would say in the current, um, what's up with the German background, and I can certainly spend a lot of time in the novel and more recently on the islands around here, but how to come to this, uh, to the center specifically, and I so enjoyed the have yesterday. And the games to the end really does value our time here. So thank you so much for having us. We're gonna now. So I want to chat a bit today about um physical activity in the context of chronic health conditions that so many people that we you know have. We know, of course, that increasing physical activity is so important, and reducing sedentary behavior is so important. And that's so much true for people that have chronic health conditions. But it can be really hard for these people, for any of us that have a chronic health condition, to actually be more physically active. And if you're involved in any kind of a leadership position or a recreation program, you might have been faced with this situation where people are saying, you know, I'd like to be involved in something, but I can't. Um, and the reasons why it was super important and complex that they might feel like, well, how can we, how can we handle this? So I wanted to chat a little bit today about that scenario. So I'm going to make note of a few prevalent chronic conditions and how they affect physical activity. And despite those situations and the symptoms that people have, we know that increasing physical activity is so important to have a chronic health condition. And then I'll give us some recommendations for how we can work around some of the symptoms and problems that people have, and a little bit about how to measure the success of the physical activity program that we've been developing when we're thinking about the health care population. So, prevalent chronic conditions. What do you see in the communities that you're working with in terms of different types of conditions? What are people telling you that they have? Diabetes, but they don't have prescribed pain from any particular condition or just like <laughs> arthritis. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Anything else for people? Heart disease, absolutely. So, you know, these are the common prevalent conditions uh, in, our, in our country and in our community. And so, Asthma, death, arthritis, diabetes, heart conditions, and also mental health conditions have a huge impact on how physically active we are. And, you know, we know that these things are prevalent, but just how prevalent are they? Well, about 11% of the population have asthma. And, you know, this the conference is very much also focused on children and, and youth, and they sort of forget, I think, sometimes that the high prevalence of um, asthma in children and youth. And so a lot of the kids that you receive coming to their programs, uh, at least one in 10, maybe even higher in their teens, have asthma. 
about 20% of the people um, of the population have arthritis. And you might find in certain uh, communities that for all of these numbers that I'm giving, the numbers are much higher. So the comment this morning was that 70% of uh, some communities have prevalence of these one harm conditions. So that's a lot of people that you're working with. Um, but arthritis, it's not exactly where here it does tend to be uh, more prevalent than adults. So we're all probably, I don't know, if anyone did the running today, it was a little hobbling by the end. Diabetes, about 90% of the population have diabetes. And you know, this is really you can be quite a side of the condition. And so a lot of kids in need have diabetes. Um, and many of them might not even know or they might be pre diabetic. Most of um, the heart disease population is occurring is happening in adults, so about 8%. And about 12% of the population have depression and anaerobic anxiety. And this, the weight is in the weight. So it's a much higher prevalence of depression and anxiety. And by youth, I'm thinking you mark up to about, you know, 24, 25, the folks to the level off a little bit. So these are the chronic, typical chronic prevalence conditions that we're seeing, whether you're in an urban setting or in a more rural remote setting. These are some of the, the things that people are having to mind. So, I don't want to tell this crowd about the difference between physical activity and exercise, but over three and four is that, you know, physical activity is really any body in sense beyond that resting condition. And so, really, most movement can be considered physical activity. And, you know, there's a lot of. Are you okay? Yeah. Addition would be, I think, that absolutely that cross cutting scenario where a lot of the people that are dealing with a lot of these, uh, a lot of these conditions would also potentially have an addiction. And sometimes the, the addiction could be the cause of some of those uh, chronic conditions. So, yeah, thank you for adding that. That's a very important one. So, physical activity and exercise. There's a lot of overlap, but really any movement could be considered for the question. And I'll briefly touch on the Canadian guidelines, but I feel like every time I read a research paper, the, the amount of physical activity that we need to see the count, it's getting less than that. You see that we have to have X number of hours of each of activity, and now we're going to be saying as little as five minutes can have a benefit. So this is great news for us, but maybe we could be a little bit more active. That it doesn't have to be a lot to be considered as a physical activity, which is a little bit separate from what we might call exercise, which is a type of physical activity. But in a sense, exercise tends to be a bit more structured. And so when we're talking about sport or some of the more structured things that people do, like running, um, that might be a little bit more on the exercise side of things. But if you're working with people that have chronic conditions and they say, well, I can't. Even even most people can do even a little bit of exercise. And what was really powerful to me today being part of the um, the games that we did was how simple some of them were and how all, all of them have been adapted for anyone with almost any chronic condition, which I thought was really powerful. So I wanted to describe a little bit about why some of these conditions can make it so difficult for people to be physical, physically active. And so I'm going to start with the example of people that have asthma or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And so chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or COD, that's kind of like my area of uh, interest. And well, it's typically a condition that happens uh, in older adult years, and it's typically from a long time of inhaling some sort of airborne pollutants, like cigarette smoke, like pollution, like uh, different kinds of industrial exposure. And so, what you put asthma or COPD can get disconnect, which is the medical term for being short of breath. That can happen, you know, when you're being moderately fat. And so people are out walking back and then they start going, something kind of short of breath. And so what do we all do when we experience something that is unpleasant when we're being active is we reduce 
activity. The physical normal is going to be out of the dog, I'm out of shape, I, I can't run anymore, I'll walk, or I can't hike up that hill, I'll go up um, in a lower level. And so we back off on the activity. And then that result will you know, become more typically deconditioned. And now, you know, if this set of lungs could provide enough oxygen for the strong body, once I start becoming less active, my lungs get really deconditioned. And now I actually need more, rely more on the lungs to be able to get oxygen to my much less sufficient oxygen. And we can get into this downward spiral where the more and more deconditioned that we get, the less efficient our muscles are in using oxygen. And so then there's more of a request on the lungs to provide. And the lungs are like, I'm kind of damaged here. I'm having a hard time picking up. So I'm going to need even more short of breath. And then you can become a little less active. You can become more uncomfortable. And you can get into this real downward spiral. Then people actually start being short of breath, even as doing their basic daily activities like having a shower or making a bed. That can be what happens in asthma or TOP. In arthritis, it might not be short of the breath that's falling people down. It might actually be pain that's happening. So, to get pain during exercise, to reduce the activity, we actually need activity to keep our joints healthy. So, our joints end up having worse joint health, and then we get pain from all activity. And again, this downward spiral can happen. So, there's actually a lot of different body systems that can contribute. The people having difficulty even being physically active. And so if you have issues with your cardiovascular system, you might have chest pain. And you hear a lot of people that have angina when they get walking, you get chest pain, and that slows them down, or just general fatigue. If you have problems with your lungs, you might have this dyspnea, this shortness of breath, and you might be easy. If you have problems with your musculoskeletal system, you might have pain or weakness. And if you have problems on the neurological, you might have issues with balance or psychologically, just being even motivated and trying to work through, uh, you know, the difficulties of being physically active can just feel too much. So we're all one person, and the people that you're working with might be going with a lot of different symptoms of having a chronic condition that can make physical activity really challenging. And so one of our challenges helping with the programming is trying to show, demonstrate, encourage, inform, collaborate with people to show them that actually physical activity is what they need in order to be able to handle some of these symptoms. But it's a bit of a hard sell for sure. So when people say, I'm too short of breath to be active, I can't. Can't do anything. Um, it's going to be hard, too hard on my lungs. We have to try to find a way to message that actually physical activity for chronic lung disease it actually helps your lungs. Absolutely. And the research evidence and the stories people tell are 100% convincing that although physical activity doesn't improve your lung health, it gives you damage to your lungs. Unfortunately, they kind of stay in that state. But we have so much lung capacity. We can actually come from the benefit of damage and be quite physically active. And so what we're trying to do when we have to exercise or be active is that we're trying to intervene before the body starts getting weak. So that if the body can stay strong, it can handle even if the lungs aren't performing that well. It can get more than enough oxygen in there to be able to do what people need to do. So we always want to intervene when people have a chronic lung condition early on before they get so weak and deconditioned and out of shape that their bodies can't move that well and that the shortness of breath gets really bad. And this is kind of my area because I'm a physiotherapist. And so for many years I've been involved in home care you have, which is basically education and exercise program for people that have chronic lung disease. And all the programs are adapted so that even if you have extremely bad shortness of breath and you feel quite weak, we can always find something for you to do. I was really 
uh, motivated by some of the activities and games that we were doing for the day, because I could imagine to be lucky for that to work for somebody who had difficulty with standing or had some problems with their balance during it. So another one that you also maybe hear when you're working with people with chronic conditions is that they have problems with their joints. And they might have wind tear, they might have diagnosis arthritis. And so there's this perception and a myth that if I'm too physically active, I'm actually going to damage my joints more. And interestingly, nothing could be further from the truth. We need to be active in order for our joints to be properly nourished. So it sort of feels like there's little bones in there. And you know, they, they feel like they're grinding with each other when you're active. And so the best thing people think is I've ever you know, take a lot of not be walking too much because it feels uncomfortable. But the reality is, is that we actually need to be moving in order for the nutrients to get into our joints, especially our knees and our hips. And if we don't do that, then the actual wouldn't be damaged to continue to occur and even accelerate. So a lot of people that we talk to are, you know, they would say, no, no, I, I, I can't, I can't walk because I have bad knees. You probably have heard this in the people that you're working with. But what we really want to do is try to find the activities that allow people to be active without causing a lot of pain, like a sense of comfort. Um, and then we can actually decrease pain by as much as just by being physically active, being physically active. And I tell them if, if there was a pill out there that kept people paying that, man, those companies would be making billions of dollars. It's one of the most powerful <laughs> tools that they have is having people be more physically active. It helps with pain, it helps with inflammation, it helps our whole inflammatory system and our immune system, and it decreases the amount of damage that's actually happening in those joints. So we want to know to convince people that, no, 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 don't stop being active because you have arthritis. You have to stay active to keep the joint health that you have. Does it help for diabetes? I think that message is pretty clear that we know that being physically active helps people's blood sugars to balance. It helps control weight, of course. It typically helps with uh, sleep. All of these things can help with um, regulating blood sugar and keeping people healthy, healthy that have diabetes. And with cardiovascular disease, you know, the important is the ways that cardiovascular disease occur is really through damage to the artery walls. And so there's all of these free radicals crazy sort of molecules that are in our bodies at all time. When we're physically active, we can reduce the damage to our arteries just by bringing in all sorts of mechanisms that keep your artery walls healthy. So if we're sedentary, we have a lot of factors that contribute to the cell. And when your artery walls get damaged, cholesterol gets in there, plaques form, you get all sorts of you know, blockage in your arteries, stuff uh, that's got uh, problems with heart disease. But if you're even moderately active, you know, you can start to actually reverse it. It's a little bit different. The lungs being physically active doesn't really help your lungs per se. But if you're active with a heart condition, you can actually start to reverse the damage in your arteries. In my heart, but it's really part of your health all over. And then even more active means even more repair can happen. But if you're super active, at some point, you're just silly. So the guy that runs the super marathons all the time isn't necessary in many months, generally, than the person that's going out for regular mysterious walks. So there is a limit, but it typically, the more active that you can be, the better your artery health and your heart health. So even a tiny bit of activity, anything that gets you out of sedentary and being active has a benefit on your heart. And so again, for people that are feeling like, well, I, I walk, I walk through the biggest thing and I get chest pain, so I can't walk at all. 
if we can start to think about programs that allow these people to be able to, you know, the people that you're working with, even just have that little bit of activity, that can help reduce the problems that people have with their arteries and their heart problems. And then it's a collectivity, depression, and anxiety. This is a harder one to talk about, in my opinion, because oftentimes the motivation for people that have um, depression and anxiety, and I have a lot of uh, family members that are coping with this. The, the thing that is the addition of physical activity is not that just that we get out and feel better, that happens to turn kind of happening. But it actually works on our brains the same way that an antidepressant will. So even if the person isn't feeling that great about their walk, being physically active will have the same impacts on our brain chemistry as taking medication. And you shouldn't use it to replace medication, but can be used to enhance the benefits of it. So people are on it for antidepressant, and then they add physical activity program, or they're on anxiety medication, they add a little bit of physical activity. It actually gives those medications a real boost, which is something that you can't do with more medication. They're on, they're massively medicated, and they're thinking, is it if you add physical activity to that, then it can make an enormous difference on what they get in of those medications. So the reality is, is that physical activity helps almost every single chronic condition that there is. I think it's like that maybe you shouldn't be overly physically active. But you really think about everything, even cancer, substance use, addiction, um, you know, all the chronic conditions that I've mentioned, anything that you're working with in your communities. There really isn't anything. There's literally about three conditions out there that maybe physical activity might be for. So it's something that we're all working with in the communities that we work with, that there's a lot of people that have chronic health conditions and they can feel like a barrier um, for a lot of people. But actually, I was still in doing a research, but there really is almost no condition that a physical activity program, it won't help to improve the symptoms that people are feeling. Helps with your heart, helps with your mood, helps with your muscle, with your whole immune system, your quality of life, your longevity, you know, there isn't really, almost every single body part gets touched positively about it or with it. But we know that it's hard, right? Like it's, if you have personally any chronic health conditions, if your family member has, your community member has any kind of health conditions, it's really difficult for us to try to develop and meet these programs to encourage you to be physically active when those signs and symptoms that I mentioned that can be distracted during activity and exercise. And so the people that I'm working with, they often me that I'm worried that if I get more active, it's going to worsen. I'm going to feel more short of breath. I'm going to flounder up my knee pain. I'm going to have heart problems. I'm going to have my blood sugars go wonky. And so they kind of feel like, well, the sky's grow. I can handle it. If I start to change things, I don't really want to have those distracting symptoms. That doesn't sound very positive to me. So why would I do that? And then also, some of the ideas that are coming out of um, the communities that we're working with in North Central BC, we have the privilege of working with um, 13 communities that receive help from characters. And so a lot of the ideas that are coming from some of the community leaders are more around support. And so they're building, they're building opportunities for more high level sports. And so when we've been chatting with some of the people in the community, they're like, well, that's great. And I'm glad that my next team will have a chance to play hockey. But I can't do those things. I'm worried that I'm embarrassed about my condition. I don't like being short of breath. That does make me cough. I don't like complaining about the pain. I, I can't keep up. 
And so I just, I mean, support of what's happening there, but none of, none of what we're talking about will apply to me and it will be applicable to my particular problems. So there is a sense of being a little left out of some of the planning that might be happening. And that can, that's a conversation that's been happening at any game. When we think about um, when, uh, you know, we were, we were listening to Richard this morning, okay? Hey, Richard's here. I want to say that as a Richard. I think so. Sorry, Richard, if I. Um, but, you know, just that, that accessibility of activity. Now, he had a, a catastrophic event with a spinal cord injury and going into a community that wasn't accessible for him when he first while. And a lot of people had to work with that. But sometimes the conditions that people have, they're a lot more compliant. And so people just see that maybe they're out of breath, but they don't really know that they have any kind of chronic condition. Uh, or they might have pain, but they look sick, but they sort of back off and participating in their And so not every condition that someone has is visible. And people feel like maybe they should be able to participate in the camp. And so there's some discomfort around that, even this first time about being involved. And so the challenge is going to think about that accessibility and being inclusive for people that need the bigger activity for sure and want to have opportunities for all levels of ability and being aware of maybe some of the chronic conditions that might be in the groups that we're working with. And being able to understand those people, how things might be adapted to both challenge them to increase their physical activity, you know, but without causing a lot of distress or further discomfort or, you know, potentially even if it be too difficult. So I wanted to share um, a few slides that we can spend in. Less than an hour, but we'll see us in a chauffeur of talk around physical activity in these communities. Um, we were trying to get a sense of well, what is stopping people? And so she's going to have great details about that. But we did um, a survey of uh, several of these communities through their health fairs and just asked the question, and then just asked the question, what makes physical activity difficult? And so youth are in the light bars and adults are in. The dark, and you can see that, you know, in the percentage before on the bottom, you can see that pain it affects me in the communities. About 15% of people were talking about having pain, muscle weakness, feeling tired, of course, a lot of adults will talk about that, but even something like difficulty breathing, which you might not really anticipate from the young people that you're working with. But they comment about having this problem. Now, whether they have an actual condition that would be diagnosed, um, this is not really, doesn't really matter that much. It's just important to recognize that there are different kinds of symptoms that even use are experiencing and also many adults. And, you know, the recklessness thing is kind of like my, my area. So, like I say, you know, it's not even really vigorous activity that's making people try to run. Even walking up the slide down is enough for quite a few of the youth, third of the youth, and two thirds of the adults to say that was challenging activity for them. But they believe it's important, like we all do. We think it gives um, a strong message for both the youth and the adults that the detection is important. And they just didn't want to do it, but they also want to learn about it. So as you think about the programming that you might be doing in your community, just to be able to think about how that education is going to happen. And so now we'll talk more in detail about that. So Sonata also asked, you know, what is the activities that people are interested in? And you can see, you know, there is a lot of what we would call sort of traditional support. Um, and full bay forage in both the uh, youth and adults, but but um, there's just an, an definite interest in having a variety of things about that, of course. So, given that, we know that there's a lot of prevalent conditions in the communities that we're working with, 
and that there is a lot of proteins and fines and things that can limit this activity for these activities. But that principal activity is so important. We do need to be able to try to figure out some way to adapt the programs that we're doing to keep people in mind so that the programs could potentially be more accessible. Now, fundamentally, the people that have any kind of symptoms or conditions are and so I'm not suggesting that there is a real homogeneous way to create a program that will cover their needs, but there's just a few tips to keep in mind as we're thinking about programming. So first of all, go watch this YouTube video. <laughs> 23 and a half hours. Um, this was done by a doctor. Some of those ones where you're going to see the hand doing a little scribbly draw thing. If you're looking for a way to maybe convince people that the collectivity is important regardless of uh, regardless of who you are and where you're at. This is a nice little simple cartoon video that is just shows some of the information I've talked about, but does it in a little fun and acceptable way. So it could be a good way to start a planning meeting if you're working with other members of the community and you need to try to convince them that physical activity is important. Um, go check out this by a family physician and it's done in a really nice way. Of course, safe and enjoyable. Um, when we're doing the game today, and I'm kind of like covering my eyes. Yeah, I'm going to lose one. Um, but now we just have a lot of fun in one hour. Like we said, you know, it's, there's so many different types of things you can do that are tons of fun. So that's, uh, that's kind of self evident, but it's important to say. We've been hearing more from research, and I think that um, the comments and, and the presentation previously, that, right, you know, with the, with the winners, we just talked about the importance of group activities for that group of women, but that there are also some people that really want and need to do their own thing, and having the pedometers to that group allow people to do that individual um, activity as well. So again, thinking about how we're going to program this fail and acceptable, as I already mentioned, and then talking to people, you can find a safe way to talk to people about the signs and things that they may be dealing with, and a new person becoming familiar if you're leading any kinds of science or you're part of a peer group about what those conditions might look like. Because some of them are quite silent, and people do not make a big deal if they're having issues with pain or if they're having issues with drugs or breath. So being comfortable yourself with the science and health conditions is important. Of course, we're, I like the idea of intention versus goals. I think that is because I think it is a much better word. What intention do they have for being more active? And, you know, what if children, youth, adult, gender, ability, how people want to be mixed up and how people want to be suffered? I thought that was such a valuable message from the women's group that, that need that they wanted to be separate for different reasons. But that cross generational part sounded like it was it ended up being a real uh, motivator for ongoing interest in the program. And so, thinking about how people might feel comfortable, sometimes people like the idea of being all mixed together, and other times people feel more safe being in a community or a population or a group that kind of feels more like where they're at. So, whether that ends up being a just that need to get them in or whether that ends up being a women's group that includes people that have chronic health conditions or not. There's lots of different ways and those are some of the questions that we are asking. The structure versus unstructured, it was interesting in the previous um, project that I, was, um, that I was involved in is how this ended up as a benefit where, uh, and again, this is a generalization, but sometimes people like to go to a class of lead they like that accountability and other people want to have a gym that's open 24 7 so that they can do their own thing at their own time so these are some of the questions that were asked and then the equipment was a plan a game traditional uh you know you heard about Zumba. <laughs> so there's lots of there's lots of choice out there and so um, as a non-indigenous person part of what we're doing is asking the questions 
around what would this community would like to be involved in. So whether it is land-based activities or you know whether it's something like a yoga class, these are all part of, uh, of the conversation and the planning. So the Canadian 24-hour weekly guidelines have come out again, and they have now separated it out into looking at exercises that may be sweat, exercises that are more step, so more like light, how much sleep people get, and then reducing the sedentary activity time. So if you haven't looked at that, it is kind of a nice framework that it's not about trying to get as much vigorous activity in, it's also about kind of reduce. That in her time and how many minutes. And that's where now it's becoming where if you can even get five minutes in once a day, that's better than getting 35 minutes in once a week. So trying to actually look at how to address all of these components uh, is part of the programming. So what about some of the specific conditions that I mentioned? How can you uh, help? The people in your community as they have these conditions or if they're family or if they're yourself. So the medical side of it is <clears throat> reminding them to take their inhalers. So it sounds simple, but it's often one of the things that um, people are not really considering around timing their activity with their inhalers. So most inhalers work to try to keep their airways open. And so you want to, if you have the start inhalers, making sure that, that you are taking them as recommended, but that also that you're not trying to be super active and then neglecting your inhalers, because that's one of the things that can make people quite short of breath. How hard should people be working? We don't to tell people that they are not going to get short of breath, because they are. And they get short of breath all the time. A lot of the time, and they've learned the difference between what's too much and what's enough, and uh, what is um, just right. And one of the things that um, I've heard from a lot of people with COPD and asthma is that they'll go to the rec section, and you know, if they have some kind of a community center or they'll be part of a class and they start moving and they get photographed, and immediately the rec coordinator runs over and oh, you know, you're doing too much, stops it down, and you're like, no, oh, I'm okay. And there's discomfort because it looks like they're not, but they're actually kind of okay. And so we don't worry as much about heart rate and things like that, which don't necessarily reflect the level of intensity. We look at breathing and it's, and so we want the person to be able to say that it feels sort of moderate to somewhat hard. And so that's sometimes you might be scaled from one to ten. Moderate or somewhat hard is in the middle of the scale. So it's not zero. People are going to get short of breath if they have the indication. But they feel like it's around that moderate, but they can handle it. And they're really sort of expert on that. So it's important um, to, to be able to hear them if they're uh, in a situation where they look short of breath to you. You want to make sure that they uh, that they're in that moderate or somewhat hard. If you're working with people who are older and have COPD, it's important to have shared preventions around. Because when people do get breathless, then they need to be able to adapt. They need to be able to lean over, lean over on the desk. They need to be able to lean against the wall or sit down for a few minutes. So when I'm encouraging people to go for a walk outside, part of what we're teaching is, okay, well, where's the bench? Where's the leg? Where's the tree? Where's something that you don't necessarily have to sit down on if you have to be able to lean on something. If you are feeling like your short breath is getting a little out of control. So that's something if they might not need a walker for their legs, but sometimes they'll end up using a walker just because it gives them something to lean against. An interesting stat is that a high percentage of Olympic um, outdoor winter athletes have asthma and being exposed to cold air can actually worsen asthma quite a bit. So if you live in cold climates, uh, I live in Vancouver, don't see a lot of snow, don't get too cold. But if you're in a place where you're getting snow or cold, cold air, just breathing in cold air 
can actually trigger an asthma attack. So another thing that we recommend is, you know, they'll have staff on somewhere. The mask can help or start. If people are saying, I can't exercise because you give me asthma, maybe it's the cold air. And so I'm trying to warm you a little bit to make an enormous difference. And the reality is, is that it goes around too hard for people with chronic illness. So if you're developing things like walking programs, um, that might be the way to go. Is thinking about, you know, work, walking in a gym if possible or walking in the flat. And, you know, if you're working with people that want to do, want to get more fit and they find it difficult to be actors um, with like running and makes them a little bit too short of rest, then they might have to focus on the So I mentioned that water to some are hard. So there's a skin scale. I mean, this is something that you could have up on a wall that the breath of some scale or the reading of perceived version are basically a similar scale. And just asking people, how hard do you feel like they're working with? And they should be in this sort of three to five area. If they're below three, you know, maybe you're not going to push it because maybe then you're just happy that they're doing something. But if they're talking about being higher than a song, that actually, there's a good relationship with that, right? the heart rate being a little too high. So this is a nice thing that we have in all of our programs in recap setting and fitness. Just that ability to look at and rate. For arthritis, reminding people of arthritis, oh, make it worse. Too much sitting makes the rain stiff. So we need to have a little burst of activity, like walking every hour or so. Even five minutes getting up and walking around makes all the difference when you have arthritis. So we're talking mostly about lower extremity arthritis here. And really having lower extremity strength is key for, uh, for your joints. So you really want to have strong muscles to support your joints. I won't get into a lot of details, but arthritis is really well researched and has a ton of online resources. So if you're working with people that have arthritis, check out this osteoarthritis specific activity and exercise network called Open. And I can go back to this slide. It's got every possible exercise and activity you can think of, so you don't have to think it up on yourself on your own. How much is too much for arthritis? Well, if it comes from a pain that the person complains of it interrupting the sleep, or that it doesn't take more pain medication, it might be a bit too intense, so they can back off a bit. It just encourages them not to give up. You know, it is a little bit of trial and error. And so every move of physical activity will improve their joint health, but you don't want to take it to the extreme and sort of these weekend warriors that go and too much like when you're having and had to do 100 foot foot fast, you know, you know, you can get that enthusiasm and sometimes diabetes. Uh, we know that small doses of activity a day can maintain stable blood sugars, and so just a quick. Walk around the building. If you need any kind of group, try to have just that quick walk around the building can make all the difference in the world. Whether you're in a business meeting at school or you need a business activity program, helps manage blood glucose. Uh, high intensity training is typically better than low intensity, but you know, work within their interests and abilities to be more being active after meals reduces blood glucose, the worst thing to get it is we all ate, continue to sit down, I'm going to look steady. Uh, really, we should have just gone out and had a little walk around because that would have actually been better for our blood sugar. And again, making sure people know how to manage their diabetes, oftentimes if they don't, I won't get into those details, but just be mindful that we're physically active and take them to me. And so people do need to be able to manage their diabetes. And if they don't know how to do that, then there's an education moment there. With heart disease, of course, we want to make sure people are safe. So have they taken a step of being cleared for exercise? They've taken their medication, but some medications have the ability to handle the chest pain and just lower the heart rate, maybe keep people stable. They want to be working at that moderate level. 
And then, of course, it's too, too difficult. The heart problem is sometimes any kind of chest pain, dizziness, lightheaded, feeling like a racing and a regular sweating nausea. These are the dangerous signals. If you're working with people, they don't even have to have diagnosed heart disease. Getting people complaining about uh, some of these things that, again, really they need to do proper medicine before they're in your program. And I would say for everyone, people are going to have good days and not good days. When you have a chronic health condition, you have good days and not good days. And so they might not be able to keep to that program every single day. It might be that they're just faint and they, they, they walk for five minutes, maybe days. So in our programs, we really just want to meet this person and try again the next day. You know, we mark it down and understand what's happening. Um, but it is a, such a set program that people feel like continue and if they did not to serve anyone. And then depression and anxiety, you know, a short burst of activity can make a big difference. The overwhelming goals can be too much. But it is important to note that for some people with anxiety, having a heart rate that's increasing can actually trigger an anxiety attack. They find that the heart rate that comes with exercise, or we might be used to it, like, oh yeah, I'm exercising, I feel my heart rate for them, that is going to be very similar to how they feel when they're having fun. And so if that is the case of someone that you're working with, then you might find that maybe not having the programs that make your heart rate go up, but maybe more focusing on strength or flexibility might be a way to address that. And I know some of the people that I'm working with, they really can hardly be do any kind of a role of activity because of this. Again, they're not having good, good days and not great days. So the last slide to survey, or the last couple of slides, is how do we measure? So we heard the great example of the, the photo voice talking to people, whether it's casual travel, more of a focus group, or even a quick survey, it's understanding how people are feeling about the program. And in that comment, you know, around uh, uh, like you only getting good answers, that's sometimes where in a different way, the anonymous survey can sometimes be um, a way of getting some of the negative things that the people are finding as well. Participation rates, that can help a little bit. No one's coming, not on something. Um, and also who's coming. So if you, if you find that you're just really attracting this kind of one, Kind of group of people, and then asking yourself, who is it? Like, where are the barriers? The Fitbit and the step count is great. Um, I don't know if anyone had heard of the easy cheap challenge that happens that the first Indian Health Authority um, had a few years ago, where they made a dip to see in a number of different communities and had a challenge. And then other people also uh, tried to beat each Step, but they were baby cheap, and it ended up being kind of a community against community challenge, and it was very successful. And then, of course, the individual intention um, could be one thing, or maybe it's a community program having a lot of number of steps that we can take it. So that's what I have to talk about today. I want to say thank you again to IPAC and and some um, organizers and the network and the that helped with my slides. Thank you very much, JC, Deborah, and Kiana. And if you're interested in learning more about some of the research that we're doing, we are definitely recruiting um, students, um, specifically PhD students. So if you know of anyone that's interested in this kind of work, these are some of the, the things that, that we're looking at in partnership with various instances. So, and then many slides with that can be bridge for anyone. So thank you very much. Any questions? I'm not sure we are fine. We have the all. No, we started a bit late. Um, no, we're pretty much we're right good. on time. Yeah. I think it's so interesting that uh, reasons for non-engaging disorder are also related to non-engaging physical activity. So, sense, self-mutual cycle of um, sedentary, so we need to be negative outcomes, and then those increasing motivation to be active.
Um, so I, I just want to start by that. My question for you what are three issues that you said? Oh, <laughs> now you can have a spot. I was regretting saying that. There is a cardiac condition, like a cardiac hypertrophy, is that the right word? Where you have an enlarged heart that uh, is, but not in a good way. Uh, and uh, activity can sometimes uh, cause uh, an arrest. And so I don't know if you've heard some of the bad points that have happened where you know, you've seen that people suddenly. Draw. Sometimes um, people know about that before, you know, uh, and so those might be people that um, are cautioned against having this type thing. Uh, the second one would be oh, I'm not very good at this. I know it's NG, like my like, Thank you. Did you say about it? My answer is chronic fatigue. Right. What used to be called chronic fatigue, yeah, myalgic and encephalitis, where the chronic fatigue activity is bad per se, but they're they are on always on the edge of overdoing. And so it often has to be like they can they can feel pretty good doing it, and then all of a sudden the next three weeks they're out. And different kinds of fatigue can also cause that for some people that have cancer, and then people that have some neurological conditions. Uh, so the cancer, not cancer per se, but again, cancer that has really, really debilitating fatigue. Again, you can just see on the cuff of overdoing it. So I wouldn't say that they shouldn't do it, but that it isn't just something where it just do it and it will help the symptoms. So it's often super, super nuanced on that. Are there other things anyone can think of? Or I guess, what about mind control? Uh, you know, somebody's just been diagnosed with diabetes and they have to figure out mm -hmm. what their what their ratios are and things. They just might need some monitoring before they get busy. Yeah, that's a good point. So uh, anything uncontrolled, really. I wouldn't say that they should just go to sedentary behavior, but these might be so what you're gonna control heart condition, diabetes. COPD, asthma, you know, it might definitely it wouldn't be a B7, but that your exercise might be super small. I hope that that's right. Anything else? Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to have to go out and this is uh, in the focal circle. I would, like, I would like to thank everyone for attending this valuable lesson today. Um, we're just going to have a short five, ten minute break until the next presentation. Um, so we are just around five minutes behind schedule. Um, the next presenters uh, will be one of the days and one for the presentation. So, uh, on behalf of the perspective, focal circle. Thank you so much. And shameless plug, but please go and see the man talk. Is it up there or here? The first one's called the long news. Benefits. Thank you. Yeah, the fifth one's called the